All right, I apologize. It looks like there was an audio issue. Um, can people hear me? All right, I very much apologize for that, guys. All right, let's dive into the webinar here. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join this Locked and Learning series. Today, we're going to be covering Unistream communications. All right, so this is the fourth in our series of uh, webinars here. This Thursday, we will be having a Visologic communication webinar as well. So if you're around, please come by again to check that out. So with communications, uh, it can feel like a big topic if you're not familiar with communications. But fundamentally, there's really only two major things you have to understand about the communications you're trying to set up. One is the physical connection of, of how these things are connected together, whether that be a wireless network that's connecting the two, whether it's a physical cable that's connecting the two. It is the physical way that these devices are able to see each other. Once they're able to see each other over some physical connection, they have to speak the same language to each other. They have to be able to understand what each other are saying. So the easiest analogy of this is a phone call. You know, if, if you call somebody on the phone, that phone is your physical uh, connection. But if you're speaking French and they're speaking English and you don't understand each other's language, it really doesn't matter if you're connected. You're not going to be able to understand what's going on. So if you have a physical connection you share between the devices and a language that you share, a protocol that you share, you'll be able to talk to each other. Now, I called out CAN bus cable over here on the right because CAN bus cable is a very specific cable setup. Um, so some people will try to create their own cables. And I just wanted to show that depending on what uh, cable you're using, um, it might be very important to go out and get a proper cable. Uh, you can see that the data lines are shielded the power lines are shielded. Both of those are then shielded again. There's a drain wire, and then there's extra protection on the outside of that as well. Um, so it's a very, very noise resistant cable. So it's important that you do use the correct cable type. So today we are going to be demoing four major uh, protocols. We're going to be demoing the the use of them, and we're going to take a look at some program, some controllers talking to each other. Uh, but first, we are going to explain some of the other protocols that we uh, support, but uh, just haven't included into the demonstration. There's a lot to cover, and I'm going to be going through this pretty quickly because uh, we want to get through as much as we can today. So you can see the demo protocols are going to be VNC, Virtual Network Computing, FTP, File Transfer Protocol, CAN Open, and Ethernet IP. Those will be demonstrated today. And then we will quickly discuss MQTT, Modbus, SQL, emailing, Message Composer, and RTSP, Real-Time Streaming Protocol. So I wanted to take a quick moment just to talk about MQTT because its structure is a little bit different than some people are familiar with. It is a publish subscribe structure. So there is a broker that acts almost like a middleman and publishers publish information to the broker and subscribers subscribe for information from the broker. So you can think about publishing as transmitting and subscribing as receiving, uh, but there is that broker in which that is happening. So you can see publisher and subscriber are both red because that is what we will be doing. We can publish or we can subscribe to a broker, but there will need to be a broker in the system somewhere. And here's a nice visual for that. We will be the client and you can see that there are three different publishers from three different machines, and they're all publishing to that MQTT broker. And then there are some subscribers that are pulling that information. And we got a lot to cover today, so with that, let's jump right into it. So 
here we have the simple five inch MQTT example. This can be found by downloading the sample apps. If you go to help and then download sample apps, it is in the communication MQTT folder. And let's take a look under our PLC communications, protocols, MQTT. And the first thing we need is to understand our broker connection. So here's our broker connection. All of this information is mostly going to come from the broker, uh, the way that we're connecting, the IP, the port, uh, what, the, what our ID is going to be, things like that. So these are your basic settings to connect to the broker. You provide a username and a password. Then you set up subscriptions. So this is information that we are subscribing to. Uh, so it's a topic on the broker that we are subscribing to. And we are pulling that information into this tag, the temperature subscription. Alternatively, we are pushing or uh, publishing this aperiodic temperature publication to a topic as well. So subscribing, pulling, publication, pushing. If we take a quick look at our ladder, we are using three MQTT blocks here, the MQTT connect, the MQTT disconnect, and the MQTT send. All three of these blocks are, are triggered simply by buttons on screen that are setting these bits, connect, disconnect, publish, and then we reset the bit immediately after. And those commands can be found under the com MQTT. And there are quite a few commands here. And the command will depend on what your project is trying to do. So we have that connect, we have the disconnect, and then that push a periodic, that is our publish, and everything else is periodic. So that periodic topic and the periodic value that we're receiving and the periodic value that we're pushing. So at an overview, that's MQTT. Now let's quick dive into Modbus. So under Modbus, you have masters and slaves. Modbus is a master-slave protocol. The master in the relationship is the only one to ever send information or request information. The slave just responds to what is happening. It responds to that incoming command. In the software, you select what you want to set the PLC up as. So if I wanted our PLC to be a master, I would go under masters and I have my panel, ethernet. Had I added a serial port, I would have also been able to select that serial port here, that physical layer that we'll be using to communicate. In this case, I'm using that panel ethernet right here. And here's my remote slave one. And you can add multiple slaves, no problem. So there's my remote slave one. And then we add the information that we want to read or write. So here's coils and periodic, so I don't have to trigger these commands. They will just be happening periodically. And this is a coil, so it's a bit, it's on or off. Maybe the broker connected bit. And this is the address that it can be read, or that we are reading. And the operation. Similar idea for slaves, add operations for the data that you want to be read. So add in a coil, it can be read, add in a register, and that can be read. Modbus is a very powerful protocol in that many devices share it. Um, so it is a very common language that devices share, so it's easy to utilize. So next, let's jump to SQL. So if we hop down here to our SQL connector, you add an SQL database. This is a database running on a PC or running on something in the network. 
you provide the connection information to connect to that database, including username, password, the database name. You can test the connection. Once you're connected, you can think about at a very simple overview, an SQL database is like a collection of Excel sheets. Um, it's a big database full of you know, sets of rows and columns for data logging, for recipes, for any kind of information that you're trying to uh, keep track of. So if you had an SQL database with recipes and you had a whole bunch of computer, uh, a whole bunch of PLCs all connecting to that SQL database, you could update the recipe in one place on that SQL database and have all the controllers be looking at that database and pulling that information uh, you know, every day, every hour, you know, whenever you want to. So once we have our database defined, you create your queries. So if you already are familiar with SQL, you can simply add a new query and type it in however you want if you're familiar with the syntax. If you're less familiar, we tried to make it easy to jump into this stuff. So you can go to this drop down here and say query examples. And so let's say maybe we want to insert you know, a new row of data into a SQL database. It creates the query for us. Now all we have to do is go to our ladder and trigger that query. There's our SQL query. And I'll select the query that I want to execute. And these are the parameters for the query. So param1, param2. So as we link information, it will create a new parameter entry. So you can keep adding tags until you have enough tags for the query that you have created. All right, let's jump down to email now. So if we go to emails, first you add an email account, provide your username, password, the email address. This is the information that you use to log into your email account. We have some of the major providers, Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, with their server settings already set up for you. But if you're using, say, a company server or something like that, you can certainly select custom and provide your own server address information. Once you have an account, you would create your email. We add an email, and you can see we get into an email building screen here where we can provide a subject. We could either hard code that or we could make it a tag And then we build out the email using these elements here. So we can say whatever we need to, reference numbers from the controller, build out the message as we want. Line break, whatever you need to. In addition, in the properties down here, you select, you create your two fields. You can have multiple two fields, as well as CC, BCC, and you can also include attachments. So you can include data tables, samplers, files from the controller, screenshots, alarm logs, whatever it might be. And we just want to link that to that email account. So once you have an account and an email, all that's left is to send the email. So you would want to do this off of some trigger. Don't want to be sending the email all the time. And we just select that email. Now we should also have a structure for this email, email one. So we can see if it su succeeded or if it failed. And if it did fail, it'll give us a status to give us some indication of why that occurred. So that's an overview on email. Let's quick take a look at Message Composer. 
So earlier, uh, when I was describing protocols, uh, I, I made the analogy to a language. We need to be talking the same language as this other device. Now, there are going to be cases where uh, we don't share a language with that device. We don't share a protocol with the device, or the device might even have a proprietary protocol. Uh, it might have a very specific string or something like that that it uses. A lot of times it's even done to make it so you can't talk to it from another device. They want you to keep, keep everything in-house. So if we go down to Message Composer, let's add a new device that we want to talk to. Now with this device, we can set up some properties, including checksums for data reliability or communication reliability. Now for this device, we can create messages. And this is basically building the protocol manually. So here, just like creating the email, we have some elements and you can build out the message. Um, exactly as they have you know described it so as long as you know what the message structure is it is possible to build that message structure here and then have the numbers fall into these number variables and have them directly linked in your project so it is possible to talk to devices that we don't natively support just understand that the more complex the protocol the more complex this implementation is going to be. Uh, ASCII protocol is one of the most simple. They're basically just sending us strings, and you're kind of just parsing the string for the information that you're after. All right. And last but not least, for the, for the quick explanation stuff here, I'm just going to add a new screen. We're going to take a quick look at RTSP, Real-Time Streaming Protocol. So if I go to media, then I go to video. So here we have a video on screen, but let's say it's not a video file. Let's say this is a live RTSP, real-time streaming protocol camera. So we have a camera that's sending us a live feed that you wanna display. Maybe it's a security camera or something like that or a process uh, you know, check, just something the operator can see into that you know, deep part of the process that's a little bit tricky to get into. Instead of making the source type a file, we can either stream the RTSP from an IP address. If that camera is you know, hosted on the network, we can punch in the IP address, or we can use the URL if they have it hooked up to a website and they're streaming it via that URL. So it's very easy to link that, that camera here. Um, in the past, I've seen customers actually both set up this RTSP as well as ethernet IP communication to the camera to control its position. And then they had like left and right arrows down here that could you know, pan and tilt the, the camera by sending commands to it. And then you'd see that updated view above. So that covers the uh, quick dive in on the things that we're not actually going to be demonstrating today, but just wanted to talk about. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up my example here. So the very first thing that I'd like to talk about is FTP, File Transfer Protocol. So if we go to our protocols and FTP, again, we want to be the FTP server. So we define an FTP server. I give it a username and a password. And now, this 15 inch Unistream is set up to be an FTP server, so we can connect to it and see the files on the SD card and push and pull those files. Now you'll see I have this screensaver screen. And the image I have linked 
is not direct. I did not link this image from my PC. Instead, instead, I am using the indirect, and I'm targeting the SD card, and I'm targeting this path, this path here. And this path points to an image on my SD card currently. So if we open up So if we go to our screensaver here, you can see this is currently the image that's being pointed to. Now what I am going to do is I am going to go and change this image without downloading to the controller. So I'm gonna open up my FTP client. So I'm using FileZilla. You can use whatever you'd like. And you can see I have my IP address of the panel, my username, and my password. And I connect. And now I can see that SD card. And I can see my logo too. This is currently that logo file. Now in my ladder, I've done something a little tricky here. And I am looking at the FTP because when you create the FTP, you also get an FTP structure that gives you feedback about the FTP, like when files are received and the path of those files. So I say when we receive a file, store the received file into that path that that image on screen is looking for. I then clear that received string for the next one and I reset that received bit. So now, if I were to take a new logo and I were to push it to the, the FTP, now remember the current logo only had the Unitronics logo, it had no text. So if I push a new file here, the new logo is on the SD, and this ladder will have received that file and stored it into the path, and so my screensaver should now be updated. And now we see the full logo. And if I wanted to go back, we would simply uh, you know, push that other logo file on there and we would be good to go. So that's FTP in a nutshell. Uh, it's not just SD, you know, it's not just images. Uh, it can be alarm logs, uh, data table files, you know, any files that are on the SD card or the USB stick, uh, you'll be able to utilize that with. So next, let's move on to can open communication. So in our project, we go to protocols, and then to can open. And right now we are gonna be communicating with an encoder. So uh, here is the can open setup. This has already been set up for the encoder I'm working with, but just to show you how easy this is, um, all you would need to do is add a new node. Here's our new node for our new can open device take the can open devices EDS file. And in our communications can open folder, we actually have the EDS file for this particular encoder, just as an example. And you can see we get the whole object directory, uh, dictionary for this device. And we would go to PDO, and we would create the PDO structures. And now we go to our TPDO. It has automatically linked those for us, and this holds the information that we are talking to this device with. 
So as far as a implementing standpoint, it's very simple to link and go. Now, a quick explanation of what these things are, what's going on here. So with can open, uh, there's three major message types that it sends. It has NMT commands or network management commands, SDO commands, service data object commands, and PDO, process data object commands. So NMT are, syst are um, system type things like turning the device on, turning the device off, the operational states of the device. The SDOs are like the configuration values and, and different settings on that device. The PDOs are really the process values. That they're the, the information that we're after. So you can see the TPDOs. This is the information that the device is transmitting us. And the RPDOs is the, the information the device is receiving from us. So we're not sending anything to the encoder. We're just getting its position back. So in our TPDOs, we have this encoder one linked. And that encoder one is simply the position, velocity, and acceleration from this device. So this is the setup for the can open device. Now let's take a look at our ladder. So the first thing we do is we configure the encoder. So if we jump into this function. So after the controller first powers up, so right after the controller finishes powering up, we start a delay. So we're starting, we don't want to start sending the moment the controller powers up. We're just giving it a 100 millisecond delay. And after 100 milliseconds, we send the value 2 to this controller. And in this case, what 2 does, we're sending 2 to this index, 2005. And that enables the three values. So before, we would only be able to get position or velocity or acceleration. Here, we are changing an SDO so that we can get three pieces of information. So we configure our encoder. Now we change status. So starting, stopping, pre-operational state. So these are these NMT commands, the network management commands. And so this is starting the device, stopping the device, or putting the device into pre-operational state. So the major modes for the device. Then we're checking communication. We'll ignore net one for just one moment. So here we have a received bit from the NMT. So if we have not received a bit from the NMT, we start a timer. And if that timer times out, then it's been this amount of time, is 500 milliseconds, since we received information. So when that happens on the next scan of the controller, this then passes power and stores 255 into our status. 255 is not a can open communication status. It's just an internal status for us to say, hey, you know, there's something going on with this communication. And at any point, if the received bit does come on, we reset the received bit. This way, every time we receive information, we are refreshing this timer so that it never finishes and we never have a communication timeout. And then programming via SDO. This is for this screen here. So SDO, this is more advanced uh, stuff for, for this example, at least. This would be if you wanted to manually set that F SDO. So again, we changed an SDO in the uh, configure encoder section. We downloaded this SDO with these preset values. You could also program SDOs yourself as well using 
a more dynamic, flexible field. So it's a, it's a good portion of the example, but we won't really need to utilize it here. And that's all we need for can open. So let's take a look. So right now we are in the pre-operational state with the encoder. So if I were to turn the encoder here, we are not seeing that position change at all. But once I start the process, excuse me, I click that on the screen. So once we start the process here, now we are operational. And as I turn the encoder, you can see that number, that position changing, as well as the velocity and the acceleration. And that is happening through those TPDOs. Then here is that programming via SDO screen, just to see it. So now we have can open communication. We're talking with our encoder. We have our position, we get our velocity, and we get our acceleration. So that's can open in a nutshell. So now let's say that we have these three values, but maybe there's another device on the network that needs, the uh, needs these values. And that other device doesn't have can open. Let's say we have to use a different protocol to talk to that device. This is where ethernet IP is a great protocol. If two devices support ethernet IP, I highly recommend utilizing it. So we go back to our PLC communications, protocols, Ethernet IP. Now, Ethernet IP uses scanners and adapters. Unlike master and slave, with scanners and adapters, once the connection is set up correctly, information is going to flow in both directions. Uh, both devices can be sending information to each other, and both devices can be receiving information from each other. The initial setup is important to understand, though. So in this case, I have some values. I have position, I have velocity, I have acceleration. They are present on my controller. And I want an Ethernet IP scanner to be able to pull that information from me. So the way I'm setting this up is that we are going to be an adapter, like an Ethernet IP node. And a scanner, a different controller, is going to be reading the value from us. So I want this to be an adapter, so I go to adapter, and I add that new adapter node. Now you can see that I need to link my input information and my output information. So the output should be pretty clear. The output is going to be those encoder values. So again, our, our can open communications are giving us our Encoder one, this is where those values are updating on screen. So I am actually just going to link that whole structure as my output size. So if I go here, and I'm just going to link that encoder one as my output. And you can see that it gives me my output size here. Now, what do I want the other controller to be able to tell? me. What I did in this example, just to have something going back and forth, is we are going to be reporting the position back. So we're going to be sending the position back to this other device. And the other device is going to be looking at that position, making some comparison to a, you know, a target position, um, and sending that target position back to us. So it's, it's going to be sharing some information back to us, and it's going to tell us whether we're at that target or not. So if I go to my structs, the target, you know, I'm actually just going to call this my encoder settings. So these are how we would change the change, like the target value and things like that. So target position, this is the window in which we say, yep, we're in position. And I also included an operator message just an ASCII string so that you can you know, send some strings back and forth between the controllers. All 
All right. Now, if we take a look, I took a screenshot from the other program. So here is our scanner info. So this is the same screen, but it is under the scanner section in the other project. So the other project that we're going to be talking to. And you can see that in this case, the O to T is going to match the O to T. So the same number in both of these places. And you can see the same size, 35 bytes and 35 bytes. Likewise, my T to O is 101. And here my T to O is 101. And my input size is 8. And here is my output size from the other controller. So all our sizes match up. And we are looking for address.127 to talk to. And as I mentioned before, Ethernet IP utilizes the CPU Ethernet address. So with that, we should be able to connect and share this information back and forth. So right now, you can see that I am disconnected. And the way that I did this, really quick, just to show you, on my main screen, I put this box, this disconnected box, in front of all of my controls. So there are controls back there, and I have them hidden. And this box is hidden based on this tag, the hide connected. So I'm hiding that connected information. And basically, in the latter, I'm just saying, if we are connected, then hide it. So if we're connected, we hide the disconnected box. And if we're not connected, we show that disconnected box. So right now, I have the Ethernet cable unplugged between the two controllers. So you can see that it is currently disconnected. And as soon as I plug that cable in, it immediately connects. Oh, excuse me, let me bring it up here. Let me show that one more time here. So when the cable is unplugged, we disconnect. And when the cable plugs back in, we get connected. And right now, the way I have this, the code set up is that within a thousand, we consider ourselves within position. So our target position is 1300. Our current position, 13918. And this bit comes on if we reach our target. And here is the other panel. So here is our other panel. So this is the information coming in. So as our position, velocity, and acceleration change, again, this can open encoder example is really the one who is getting the position value. So as I change the position here, as I change that position, this controller updates the position, sends that information over to our scanner, and here's that position, the velocity, the acceleration. Now, likewise, you can see right now, my target position is 13 million here. That is from this out. So this target position is controlled from this other device. So let's say our current position is this. You know, We are not in position right now. Uh, let's say that our target position is now So now that we changed our target position to be 1,000, again, I gave myself 1,000 buffer. So as long as I'm within 1,000 on my position, I consider myself in position. And you can see that this check has now been reached. So this in position or not in position is not being checked on this controller itself. It is being checked over here, and we are sending, sending that out. Now this message. 
we can send information to this device as well with the current setup. So, so it's not just uh, it's not just numbers or bits. Uh, you could do whole strings as well between the devices. And now last but not least, I just wanted to show, uh, we've already been seeing VNC. So this, the ability to see these screens like I'm doing through my PC is VNC. And VNC is enabled in the password management section. So if you go down to password management, I have the VNC enabled with no password required. So anybody can connect to this. And I have set up the, the same settings on the other panel as well. And down here, instead of using a PC to do this VNC connection, I could alternatively trigger VNC connections right through the code. So if I go to my protocols, and then I go to my excuse me, let's go to our ladder button here. And so here I have this button, connect to scanner, and I gave this button the action of loading a VNC connection, and then I have connection 01 set up to target the other PLC. So right now I am connected. I'm gonna close out of our other connection here. So here's that five inch screen. So this is actually a 15 inch panel that I'm connected to right now. And we are about to connect to the five inch panel right through the 15 inch screen. So I am loading that connection through the 15 inch screen and I currently have the five inch panels server resolution set to 15 inches. That way when I connect to the five inch panel, I am able to see the five inch panels information and it populates the full resolution of the 15 inch screen. So right now I'm connected to another PLC through a PLC. So I'm connected to the other device. I could be entering values here. And then all I have to do is exit that VNC connection. And you can see that value that I changed on the other PLC has now been sent over and we can see it here. So it's possible to, you know, have a whole bunch of these PLCs all around the factory and, you know, just connect into the one that, that you need to see at any given time. So that's the quick and dirty on communications. I uh, tried to include as much as I could in as short of a time frame as possible. It, it's a little bit tricky just because of how many you know settings and parameters there are for each protocol. Didn't want to go too deep on anything. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to come out and watch this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, please hang around for the Q&A session after we end here. I'd be more than happy to answer any of the questions that have come up during the presentation as well as any that get posted at the end. Thank you again and we hope to see you soon. All right, let's take a look at our questions. Okay, uh, panel ethernet versus CPU ethernet. Um, so panel ethernet, the, the easiest way to think about it is when in doubt, panel ethernet's gonna be the right way to go. Uh, panel ethernet's gonna be just about everything. Um, now that being said, the things that the CPU ethernet is used specifically for 
is message composer, so that custom protocol that you're building, Ethernet IP, uh, the protocol we demonstrated. It is possible to do Modbus over it, but that's a bit advanced. You don't have to worry about that. Normally, Modbus is going to be through the panel. And you can also do TCP server, which is kind of like the TCP, like raw information, kind of along the same lines as that message composer again. I see a question here about the web server. That it's a good question to email in. Um, yes, we will absolutely be sharing this recording. We'll post this um, on the registration page. So where the registration link was, you'll now be able to see uh, a recordings link once this is uploaded. You see that can open EDS, uh, yeah, can open does support EDS files. Does EIP support EDS? Um, so uh, right now, we do not support the import of EDS. That being said, I believe that that is underway, whether it's going to be in the next release or an upcoming release, I do believe that's going to be coming shortly. Um, if you're having any trouble, with Ethernet IP, we are very familiar with EDS files I have set up hundreds of these devices. Um, so if you do have any questions, just email in the EDS file, say you're having some trouble getting this set up, and you know we, we'd be more than happy to take a look. Can you quickly show how you got the values into the position and velocity fields? Absolutely. Great question. Skipped over that. So here is our can open communication. So in can open, this TPDO encoder one, this was created when we created the structures from the EDS file. And that encoder one is type encoder struct. And if we click in there, we see the three members of that structure, position, velocity, and acceleration. So on the screen, if we want to see or interact with position, we link that encoder one dot position. So you start typing the name encoder one, and we want to link the position. Same idea for the velocity and for the acceleration. If I do happen to skip over your question, it might just be more of a support question. Uh, just email that question into support Unitronics. Unican is the Unitronics language or protocol um, that, that we speak over a, a CAN bus physical port. So that's that's a you know internal great protocol. Uh, you know if you're if you're working with our devices, but not many other devices are, are going to have support for Unican. So a question about the V130 and a VNC. Um, so the Vision series does not support VNC. They have remote operator, which is our app available for PCs and in your app store for your phone. Um, as far as two ethernet ports, there's only one ethernet port for the Vision series. That being said, plugging an ethernet port into a switch is basically like adding additional ethernet ports um, you have multiple sockets so you know that one ethernet port can have multiple sockets meaning multiple uh, independent lines of communication happening at the same time remote operator app so that it's a it's a vision question um, you'd be entering the ip address of the the plc that you, that you want to connect to 
does the VNC server actually run on the PLC? Yes. So the the um, the server is running right on the PLC. Uh, it is hosting the information. So when I go to our oh, also I forgot to mention this is where that VNC client was set up, where I, I have it tied to that button press. Um, but the VNC server itself, when we go to our password management, VNC, this is enabling that server on the controller. And you can give full access password and view only password. Uh, that way, if you do just want a display somewhere, you would connect using that password. How many simultaneous ethernet connections can be up? Um, so I don't have a hard number off the top of my head, but I can say comfortably dozens for the Unistream. Uh, Vision, it's four or eight, depending on what controller you're working with. Unistream, it is dozens of simultaneous connections. Um, I actually haven't ran into anybody who's you know met or exceeded that, that limit. One question about the built-in models as far as the protocols that are available. Yeah, so protocols, um, between the models for the built-in, you do just want to check the website. Um, it's going to be your best bet to get the most up-to-date information, and it lays it out nice and clearly here. This is a document that I think people um, don't find, and I find it. I think it's a very useful one when you're looking at those uh, those model comparisons. Scroll down to the bottom here. You have that PLC comparison. So SQL, I believe, is the one protocol uh, that's that's not shared between the two. So SQL client. So SQL, you would need the pro. Uh, SQL would not be supported on the B5 or the B3. How many web pages can we create? Um, I don't believe that I don't have a hard limit off the top of my head. I don't believe there's a hard limit. I believe it goes back to the dynamic memory of the Unistream uh, where you can use the memory for what you want. So if your project was lighter and you wanted everything on the web server, uh, I think it's all where you're going to use that memory. Regarding the UAC, go ahead and email that question in. It's something that I'd have to test or, or double check on. It looks like that is, looks like those are all the relevant questions to the material we were covering here. Um, if you, if I missed you, if you have any questions, I'll be hanging out here for another minute or two. Feel free to, uh, or, you know, five minutes here, feel free to post those below. Yeah, EDS import for Ethernet IP. So that was something I answered uh, a moment ago. Um, we do not currently support it, but it is on the way. And my name is Zach, Zach Hampton. Do all Unistream PLCs have the same communication capabilities? Not necessarily. Uh, SQL is going to be the major one that is a difference between the pro and standard models for the built in and standalone PLC controllers. Uh, everything else is, is going to be available across the board. Um, so if you're not talking about the controllers that have the basic and standard versions, if you're just talking about the main Unistream controllers, 
all the protocols will be available for all the controllers, given that you have the physical port available. So taking one of the built-in five-inch uh, you know, panels as an example, there's no built-in CAN bus port, um, but there's no reason that you couldn't add on a CAN bus port and then you'd be able to utilize those, those CAN communications. All right, no other questions are coming in here. So I think with that, we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, checking this out. I hope, uh, you know, we might have some more coming. Hopefully we will. And, you know, hopefully you'll be able to join those. If you have any questions, just email us support at unitronics.com or shoot us a quick phone call. It's 17-657-6596. Thanks again, guys. And you all stay safe out there.